All right, we're about to get started with our last session, um, session six. This time we have Gabby Hale from Emory, from Emory University, Tara Wood from Clemson, Jenny Bowen from Buncombe County, North Carolina Archives, and Carly Herndon from the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and so again, we'll take questions at the end of the session. So I'm going to turn it over to the presenters. Hi, everyone. Um, one second. Let me get this rolling. Maybe. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? I'm going to assume yes until told otherwise. Yes, great. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you guys, everyone, for being here at the end of a long day. I really appreciate it. Um, I am presenting on everybody in Rose Library social media. So my name is Gabby Hale. I'm the outreach archivist at Rose Library at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So for some context, the Rose Library is Emory's main special collections library. We have around 134,000 rare or unique books, 2,200 manuscript collections, some that are one box and some that are 1,300 um, Hollander boxes. And we serve about 1,000 researchers each year in our reading room, plus around 800 students in our instruction spaces. So we're very busy. Um, we have several main collecting areas that all kind of talk to each other, um, including modern literature and poetry. Um, we have a special focus on Irish poets within that. African-American history and culture, political, cultural, and social movements, including um, things like the punk collection, uh, punk people in Atlanta, um, LGBTQIA plus history, HIV AIDS crisis, um, other sorts of activism fall within that collecting area. We are the repository for university records, and we also collect rare books. So I started at Rose Library in January of 2023. Um, I did not have any formal education in social media. Um, I have an MSLS, like I'm assuming many people on this call have, um, but no actual like formal training in managing social media, although I did do a little bit of um, content creation at my previous job, um, but on a team. So when I started at Rose, I inherited three main social media accounts, including Twitter, which some people call X, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, and the person who had had my job before me had actually um, been gone for about a year. It can be academia, you know, it takes a long time to get people hired. Um, and so the person who'd been running social media in, in the absence of an outreach archivist was an operations coordinator who could only really post when she had time. Um, so there's really limited activity on all of the accounts prior to my starting. While I post to all three of the accounts regularly, I do focus most of my efforts on Instagram. And that's because most of the patrons and users we want to reach are on Instagram and very active, like our student population, our donors, our researchers, and other Emory departments. So in this picture, you can see I track all of um, the, the posts I make, the followers, things like that, in this very you know fancy Excel spreadsheet. And over the last year, I've got some minimal growth on Twitter and Facebook, but I have gained about 900 followers for Rose Library on, um, on Instagram, which I'm pretty happy with. So some things that I've learned over the last year, um, I've really been trying to create like a brand for social media for Rose Library. Um, I'm fortunate that I can have a premium Canva account for the library and you're able to import your um, branding in. So things like logos, specific colors, fonts. So I imported all my offers and then I added in and chose a few specific colors and fonts that I wanted just for Rose Library. I, yeah, I do love Canva. I, I could not live without it. Um, and so I also wanna say that I'm the only person who posts to Rose Library social media. Um, other people give me some suggestions, which I'll get into in the next slide. Um, but I'm the I am the one in control. And so I feel like that allows me to create a very consistent tone from post to post. Um, I really try to be professional, but also very approachable um, because so often archives can be kind of seen as stuffy. Um, but I want us to be seen as fun, the cool hip library. Um, but given all of that, I do definitely keep in mind at the core of everything that I post is that I'm promoting our collections and services. So here on the um the right or I don't know what side it is on. The, the picture here 
um, is of, I did a blog post on if you like certain Taylor Swift albums, you would like certain Rose Library collections. Um, I had way too much fun with that one as a Swifty. Uh, speaking of things that are uh, popular, I definitely try to keep up with trends. So we are not allowed to have a TikTok account at Rose Library. Um, we're not even allowed to have like access TikTok on our personal phones at work anymore. Um, unfortunately, but I do have an account in my own time that I see what is trending on TikTok and I'm able to, whenever I see things that will translate well to libraries or archives, recreate that and then post it as an Instagram reel. And I find that videos are really the most popular thing that are being um, like pushed by the algorithm at the moment. And in fact, our most popular video um, and posted all that has happened in the past year and a half is a video um, that was based off a TikTok trend that I got my coworkers involved in. And I think that one is sitting around like 17,000 likes, which is pretty good for an, a library that at the time had 1300 followers. So I was very, I'm very happy with that one. Um, my coworkers helped me out. Obviously, like I said, I put them in my videos. Um, I think I like to think that they're getting used to me asking for them to be in videos. Um, but they also suggest things like specific collections that can be highlighted or services. Um, our instruction archivists will take pictures of the classes with permission, of course. And um, and people love to see who comes into the library. In addition to working with my coworkers my, directly within Rose Library, I also collaborate with um, other librarians throughout all of Emory's libraries. We have multiple, and then also with different Emory departments. So on Instagram, you can do what's called a collaborative post, which is where um, the people in the feed will see it one time, but it'll have multiple accounts at the top that you can look there. So it's good for reaching new audiences. So I'll collaborate with our main Emory Library account to promote our events. And also our um, Emory University History Department has really been trying to up their game as well. And so we'll collaborate on posts. I do try as depressing. For example, um, last summer when somehow the government said that aliens are real, and I think we've all forgotten about that, but I did do a post um, with some items from our collections. If you hear anything, my dog is barking. She's in her sleep, sorry. Um, but I did a post about a woman in our collections who believed aliens existed. So we'll see if anything ever happens with the whole aliens thing, but that's where that stands at the moment. In addition, um, obviously we have these month long observances like Poetry Month, African American History Month in February, Pride Month right now. And I do think it's important to say that you should not just be promoting um, particular groups or particular topics for one month a year. I think it's important to do that all year, um, but I do think it's helpful and there's value in, in posting more about that in the month that um, is celebrating. So for example, it's Pride Month, I've been posting more of our um, Pride collections. And lastly, bringing in the title of this presentation, everyone loves dogs. So I'm a huge dog person. Um, I love to incorporate animals in any post I can, um, and whether it's cats, dogs, horses, whatever. Um, and people really respond because we all have emotional attachments to animals. And here on this side is another example of, um, I did a different variants of the Taylor Swift Tortured Poets. So this is the black dog variant on the side. Speaking of dogs, um, I'm hoping this works. If not, okay, we're gonna try seeing it, seeing if it works as a video. Um, I have a dog named Evie, who's the one who was just barking a second ago in her sleep really cutely. Um, and I try to get her involved in videos. So I'll have her put on, um, we'll just do little things to, to promote our events, so we will see here. So we do an annual uh, poetry reading. And so um, I had her involved and it, it got a lot of likes. And I, I don't know for sure that it made more people come to the poetry reading, but I like to think that it did. Um, I also did a Rose Library Connections game um, because I don't know about you guys, but I love my New York Times board games. Um, and I actually got my coworkers feedback. Um, I had them play it before I put it out online and they had some really helpful feedback about that.
I also keep up with what's going on in Atlanta. So when Beyonce came to town, I had one of our graduate students who loves Beyonce tell me what people are wearing to the concert. And I was able to find some, um, some people who, you know, they could draw inspiration from, from Rose Collections. I also last summer when the Barbie movie came out July, um, Rose Library images that matched different Barbies that Mattel had made. And a last example of content, um, I find that people really love seeing our staff members. And so I think it's important because so often when people find these things online or they find them in the reading room that's processed so beautifully, but it's just that they don't see the work that went into it. And so I think highlighting the staff members who are doing the work is really important. Plus we have a lot of um, staff members who are very, very beloved by our communities that we serve. And so um, people love seeing them and I get that, that feedback whenever I post about them. So this is some of us at Halloween last year. And I guess I should mention a few things that have not worked as well, or just things that are not as positive. Um, everything of social media is a guessing game. There's all these different algorithms and they're always changing. Um, right now, videos are being um, shown more to people, but who knows if that's gonna continue to work. There's constant issues with Twitter ever since Elon Musk took it over. The analytics is really dodgy um, and you never know why things are being shown to certain people. And lastly, I find that overly wordy posts don't tend to do very well, um, whether that's in the graphic. So if you're on Instagram, putting it in the actual picture or the caption, um, people don't wanna read. So uh, those have not done as well. And lastly, um, a couple times a year, I'm asked to post about different fundraisers that Emory's doing. And those never get good traction because no one likes being asked for money. And I get that. Um, but that's where I'm at. So thank you guys for your time. And I hope that you continue to enjoy this awesome um, symposium. I'm also part of the people who are putting it on. So if you're not a member of Society of George Archivist, <laughs> I recommend that you join us. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Gabby. Um, that was great uh, because we are always wringing hands over the social media and what to do and what will work. Um, that's part of some of the same problems with what um, I'm going to talk about. Let me get over here to share. And let's see if that works. Okay, can we see what we can see? Yes, we can to... see. Perfect. Uh, let's start from the beginning. Okay, so. Um, what I want to talk about is developing and launching a podcast for outreach and research. Uh, it, you know, it, you think a podcast for research, but we've actually found a way to do it. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, I decided to go ahead and put in my dogs and my cat who owns the, owns the dogs. <laughs> Those are um, a father and son duo. Um, Fergus is uh, the one with, um, without the crazy eyes. The crazy eyes is um, Archibald, Archie. And that's Max, the big cat who weighs 20 pounds. In any case, sometimes doing a podcast or any kind of project like this can seem like this guy. What are you going to do? How are you going to do it? And so forth. And I know I certainly felt that way. I had been wanting to do a podcast for a long time, but it seemed a little bit overwhelming at first. Instead, it will end up, I hope, looking something like this, which is what I ended up with. Um, I had a format uh, for visualizing the entire process. Um, I have to admit that I went to the, um, the Oracle of Google and consulted it for information about how to do a podcast. I landed on a number of different um, sort of guides. The best one that I found um, that was very simple, simple and I think it was probably, um, uh, what do you call it, a uh, pitch to high school students, but you know, then there's me and um, was the NPR guide, the National Public Radio Guide to Podcasting, which ended up being hugely um, helpful to me because it helped me think everything through, all answer all the questions before I got started doing really anything. And that is what, you know, that's the number one takeaway from all of this was that you want to go through and answer all the questions. And I'll explain what I mean by that. But there's, you know, having the idea, this is great. And what is the name of it? Well, it was kind of easy. The name was the first thing and it was super easy for me because we're at Clemson. We are the Tigers, Tigers in the archive. Um, that's just kind of a, 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 no, a no brainer. But there were a lot of other ideas that were, you know, you know, floating around in my head. I'd been wanting to do this for 
you know, about two years, but I didn't have the sort of the support from, um, you know, the, the people in the room, you know, that I worked with as much. And so, and plus, you know, with COVID and getting over all that, it was something that we just decided to put off for a little while. So I have the, um, you know, all the ideas came up with the name and then where do you go from there? Well, that's sort of the vision of what is it that you want to do with the podcast and uh you know so what's the point of it and um that then becomes part of it is you know to start out with is a description uh, and this forced me forced me to think everything through uh, as far as you know what is it that i really want to do with this thing um who do i want to reach who do i want to have as as guests you know what are the end what's the end product what will be the benefits all of that kind of stuff um, if you, uh, you know, you have to think about that while you're thinking about what the description would be. So, of course, you know, they always say, oh, you have to have your elevator speech. Well, I started with the long description because I wanted to make sure that I got everything into my plan, into my description right from the start. And then I could, I could, you know, distill it down to the one sentence version. Like if I'm in the elevator and somebody says, oh, you do a podcast, what's it about? And I can say that. And, um, you know, so basically uh, there, that process of description, long description, which was basically a paragraph to a shorter version, one sentence, kind of a long sentence, but still it's one sentence. Um, then made sure that I had thought about what it is I wanted from this podcast. And then I was prepared to start answering the questions and, and write it all down. Okay. That's, you know, you want to make sure that you have got all your notes so that you can refer back to it to just in case you're going off in the wrong direction, or you feel like you are, you can go back to look at what you, what you wanted to do. So the first question is really is who's your audience going to be? In our case, we were the special collections and archives at Clemson University, and I, I forgot to say, in the instruction and outreach archivist for special collections and archives. I have this kind of weird appointment at the moment where I'm, I, half my time is spent teaching history courses. I have a PhD in early modern English history, and the other half of my time is done in, in the uh, special collections and archives. Um, I, and I do a lot of instruction. Um, I... Uh, completed about 120 um, individual instruction sessions all by myself um, in this academic year. So I'm pretty proud of it. We've been doubling our instruction each year since I started um, four years ago, right in the middle of COVID. So when you are thinking about what you wanna do, um, your audience is the first question uh, to answer. Uh, in our case, you know, this is going to be something that we want to be popular. So our audience is going to be certainly our very robust alumni audience. It's going to be students, faculty, researchers generally, and then, of course, the Clemson community, the upstate and so forth. So on that, you know, first uh, whiteboard that you saw, I listed everybody. I wanted to make sure I hadn't missed anyone. And I'm one of those people that visually has to see it to know that I haven't missed anything. Um, so your audience is probably going to help you then answer a lot of the other following questions. Um, so who are your stakeholders and your partners? So your audience is also a stakeholder and it can be your partner if people hear you, hear an episode of your podcast and contact you about another story or an items to donate and that sort of thing. Um, but the stakeholders are going to be probably most of we all think of as the usual suspects, it's going to be our marketing department. It's going to be, um, you know, other libraries on campus. It's going to be the alumni association. Uh, it's going to be the athletic department, especially here at Clemson and so forth. So that again is one of those things you want to keep in mind straight up front to answer those questions. You also want to think about what need you might be fulfilling with this or what opportunity does this provide that you could then extend to others by, um, you know, sort of um, uh, amplifying their stories through a discussion of artifacts and documents that are in the archives. And then, of course, what benefits will there be from doing this project? We, of course, would like people to donate things and money to us, but we also want to help it use the podcast to forge partnerships 
uh, with the stakeholders and more. Uh, this has led to, the podcast has led to a lot of people calling up and saying, oh, I have this item or, oh, I really want to talk about, um, you know, an event that happened while they were at Clemson. We are constantly this getting feedback and, um, and um, communication and support as people, as the episodes are released. There's also, of course, besides the benefits, there's always obstacles. You know, in my case, it was my learning curve to learn how to do the recordings, how to do the editing, and that sort of thing. Fortunately, we have a, a fairly robust oral history program. We had a lot of the, the equipment that we needed. Then, of then there's also like the marketing. Sometimes we don't, in the libraries, we don't think about that as much, but I had to marshal the help of our mark marketing person in the libraries, but then I also make contact with the people in the athletic department, the alumni association, and so forth. And what that's really done is let us build these partnerships with um, other folks who are doing marketing so that we can sort of cross-pollinate with projects that they're doing. One of those is with the Clemson World Magazine. And um, I did an article with a retired, the retiring editor of the Clemson World Magazine, Nancy Spittler. She'd always wanted to do an article on the 10 weird things in the archive. I said, yay, let's do it. We did that article, beautiful photos and everything else. And then she was my first interview for the podcast. And that's the kind of thing that we do all along. Uh, let's see, with, um, you know, then you want to think about engagement. There's the sort of engagement with people coming to your podcast and listening to it. But we want more than that. We want to bring people into the archive, both researchers and the public for a public archive. Um, we want to bring the alumni in to come and see the yearbooks and that sort of thing. Uh, so we want to engage with um, our audience in a concrete ways beyond the episodes themselves. But we also are that using the podcast to create engagement with local organizations like the African American History uh, Museum and, um, you know, other historical societies in the area and beyond. So finally, then, of course, this is the hardest one for me. It still is. What does success look like? Well, we've got about six or eight episodes up now and we're going to have more and more. It's an it's been popular. But is it enough to look at the statistics that Spotify or one of the other platforms can give you that's useful? But what else will, you know, be what we think of as success? Um, and, you know, that's the thing. Thinking it through beforehand is then going to save your sanity, but it's also going to make sure that you stay focused and on tasks so that you can have a successful podcast Oop, hang on so you know designing the podcast are things that you have to think about what's the format going to be interview solo show where you just talk like say you know um Rachel Maddow does really well with that she does a kind of a combination of interviews but she always has her opening um, monologue is it going to be some kind of combo of a round table with you know interview and so forth Listen to a lot of different podcasts if you don't already. Most people seem to at least listen to some now just to get an idea of what you might want to do. We went for a kind of conversation, interview, more round table kind of thing um, so that we could have just, you know, people having a chat, a discussion, but with guidance. We do, I do research for each episode so I know what I'm talking about and what questions to ask. And of course, I do write a script. It's a loose one, but it is something to guide me along so we're not just rambling on and on. And you may want to consider transcription. Um, you can do it with a software, but transcription can be useful if you could post those transcriptions for those people who may um, prefer to have the, um, the, the interviews or the discussion in um, uh, print. You can also consider whether or not you're going to also post short video clips. You can use those for social media and so forth. But the big thing, of course, is just staying organized and getting ahead on episodes. I'm just telling you right now, if you haven't done a podcast and you want to, try to get two or three ahead so that you can schedule them to drop when you want them to. We do about one a month. 
Uh, but, and the summer is when I'm gonna get caught up and ahead. The platforms, oops, pardon me. There's plenty of platforms. We're on Spotify, it's free, it's fairly simple. Um, the recording equipment, you can use your phone, you can use a variety of, uh, of recording equipment, but make sure you have some good microphones. Uh, and then there's the consideration, considerations of where it's gonna live forever, or at least as close to forever as we can. So storing the episodes, like I said, we're on Spotify right now, but we are going, we are making some of the decisions about accessioning the um, podcast interviews and then cataloging them. We do, we of course did have to make sure that we have a, um, a, a proper um, uh, form uh, where we um, make sure that our interviewees, the participants are signing off, that they understand that this is both entertainment and that it will end up in as a um, part of our collections. So the thing is be prepared. Um, that will save you so much heartache, um, like, oops, you know, I forgot something, I'm going to have to re-record the whole thing. So that's, um, you know, a quick, quick thing that's Tigers in the Archives. I hope you take a look at it. Uh, and basically, if I were to say my one sentence, though, I don't actually have it memorized at this point. Um, my, my bandwidth in my brain is a little short this week. But what I want to do is highlight the stories and research and work that um, our Clemson community from faculty, researchers who come to the archive, as well as students uh, who are doing research projects um, where I'm interviewing them to um, give them something to put on their resume as, a, as a, an invited sort of talk. Um, we are going to be next Friday interviewing a bunch of middle school kids who are going to be here for a hidden history camp. And um, they get to look at some artifacts and documents and then I will and answer some questions and then I will interview them for an episode of the podcast. We're going to have about 14 students. We'll cobble together each of their little personal interviews so that family and friends can listen to it. Um, and I think it's going to be fun. That came with a whole different thing. If anybody's wondering, we're using only first names and maybe last initial and so forth. And we do have um, a um, permission slip for that. But that's about it. I do have, um, just so you know, and I'm happy to um, share my slides. You know, if you want to start a podcast, like I said, head on over to NPR with their um, training. So you want to start a podcast. The blueprint, what I what you saw on my um, on my uh, um, uh, what do you call it? Oops, sorry, the dogs. This uh, whiteboard is essentially me recreating the uh, the blueprint that they off they that they provide. So there you go. I hope you all go or you know if you're doing a podcast or if you want to do one. I hope that was this was helpful. How'd that go? <laughs> All right, I'm next, I think. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Yes, we can, I can yes. hear you anyway. Perfect, yep. all right. I can hear you. Hopefully my PowerPoint, there it is. All right, so um, this is my team. Uh, we are the Buncombe County Special Collections in Asheville, North Carolina. And though I'm the presenter today, Jenny Bowen, I'm there in the center. Um, this is the group of people who we all work together and this is very much a collaborative effort. Um, so we are three Catherines, the Carissa and me, Jenny. I kind of don't fit, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so we're presenting about food history and historical potlucks at the archives. And that is uh, something we've only done twice so far. We're hoping we can do it again um, in the future and continue this, uh, this tradition. And so once a quarter, we have something called uh, an in-service week or a GOST week, a ghost week, uh, standing for get our, so, uh, get our stuff together week. Um, and we kind of close down. We don't have uh, open hours in the archives. Uh, we are, the Buncombe County Special Collections is part of the Buncombe County Library System. Um, and we are a, a medium-sized archive that 
really works on all of Western North Carolina history, a little bit of East Tennessee, a little bit of Upper South Carolina, but focused mostly um, in Buncombe County and the surrounding counties around us. Um, and so for that week, we closed down. We don't have open hours. Um, we are appointment only. And then we spend that time really digging into collections, um, weeding what we need to, processing what we need to. And one of the things that we have started doing is we do a seasonal potluck with all the staff of the special collections. Um, so we've done a fall potluck and we've done a spring potluck. And uh, hopefully in the future, we'll have a winter and a summer potluck. Um, and so each of us uh, picks two recipes, um, a minimum of two recipes. If you want to do more and you're ambitious, go right ahead. But uh, typically we try and say, you know, one sweet, one savory, so we don't end up getting a table full of desserts because goodness knows we all love a good dessert, but we can't survive on that for lunch. So where do the recipes come from? In our collections, we have scores of recipes um, and food books. Um, we This is what's in our reference collection, but we also have handwritten recipe books that have been passed down. Um, one of the recipes I used in the first one came from uh, the author Thomas Wolfe, who's very famous in Asheville. It was from his um, maiden aunt's uh, hand pa passed down recipe with you know handwritten things in it. And so that was pretty special. Um, but our recipes range anything from mid 1800s uh, pamphlets to contemporary publications. One that we used in our most recent one is a cookbook that's only been out for about um, a month or so. And that's about African-American Appalachian recipes, um, which made a wonderful cobbler. Um, one of the great things about recipes is that they are passed down a lot of them through the generations. We, they've come from all over the place. We've got hotels, we've got restaurants, hospitals, churches, political parties, of course, the school ones. You're never sure if you should use those ones, um, but it's a lot of fun to read through the recipes as we pick out the two that we want to use each time. Uh, you learn a lot just going through and reading about how that recipe came about, how it was passed down, why it's popular or why it's um, traditional. Those are all really valuable things to know and something that maybe we wouldn't have accessed without this activity. That's some cornbread right there, if you can't tell. So, oh, and then these are some of the other things we've made. There's the peanut butter pie, there's a cheese tomato squash casserole, and then something called vinegar taffy, which is more of a cough drop than a taffy, things you learn. Um, so why do we host historical potlucks? Well, the tradition of food is that it brings people together. So in this act of doing it, we broaden the fellowship among staff um, and we have a great time getting together, talking about what we've learned, what we experienced, what challenges we came across, and then just sharing food together is just a joy. It's the best lunch that I have, uh, you know, that month for the most part, because there's so much to choose from and just so uh, so much to get from it besides just the food. In that process, we also expand our knowledge, as I was saying about the cultural heritage and the history of the region through that recipe research and the process of making each dish. We uh, get to learn a lot, like I said, from what gets passed down, what's important to people throughout the years, what is still traditionally good today and what's been built upon. Those are all valuable things. Um, and it teaches us how people of different means and different um, socioeconomic backgrounds, different cultures, how they all may do with what they had at different points throughout history. Some of the challenges that we get to deal with. Um, a lot of times when you find old recipes, there's old phrases like, what's a jigger? How much is a pinch? Uh, it's not supposed to say jigger in there twice, but, and then there's different kinds of spoons. Uh, like a coffee spoon is different than a dessert spoon, not a tablespoon and a teaspoon, but what people had on hand at that time. And, and how much is a pinch? Is a pinch a little bit more than actually what you pinch in between your fingers? And it, and it actually is. Um, so learning, how to decipher the colloquialisms and the languages that are used throughout history. Um, a lot of times things can be very seasonal or hard to find, like raw milk is something that is used in a lot of old recipes. That's not very easy to find. 
Um, seasonal items are a lot of times things that are forged from the Appalachian area around us. Um, uh, 19th and uh, 18th and 19th century cookbooks are not great on instruction. Sometimes a recipe literally will be three lines and you have to kind of decipher what all that means, how much to mix something for, how much to cook something for. Um, wood fire stoves were very different to cook on versus modern stoves today. Um, the heat is completely different. And so the time is completely different. You can't just put it in the oven and walk away. You really got to kind of stick with that recipe and make sure that it is going to turn out. Uh, one of the things that I did in our spring uh, potluck was I made violet jelly because that was something I was always curious about. And you only get like a window of about two weeks where you can pick violets, uh, wild violets. So I went to a friend's house. I picked a bunch of violets and then I made this beautiful jelly. Um, it was an interesting flavor, a little flowery. Um, there's a lot of lemon juice in the pectin, so that gave it some flavors too, but it was just a really interesting experience uh, and one that I definitely wouldn't have done without the opportunity of sharing it with my coworkers and colleagues. Some of the outcomes that we have had, uh, we have been producing, we have a very active blog called the Hertel blog off of our um, main website. And we have posted uh, one post so far of our vintage vittles and we'll have another one coming up here very shortly. And what this does is this documents, where did the recipes come from? What were our, our experiences? What did we learn? And one of the things that was really great is when we went to our staff day with all of our fellow uh, librarian colleagues uh, this last April, we found somebody from a separate branch who read our blog and it actually inspired them to do a community harvest recipe uh, or a recipe harvest of their own within their own community. And so those will be added to our collection eventually and we'll have even more recipes to work with. But we, we were really happy to see that it had inspired people to still, you know, pay attention to what is, what is the food that people are working with today in this time period and era. Um, and then it's just a lot of fun. As I was saying, we also get to take, there's always way too much food um, with, you know, a minimum of 10 dishes for five people. That's just a lot of food. So we end up sharing it with the rest of our uh, library, library colleagues here in our building, which you know, we have youth services and preschool and adult services and so on and so forth. So they all get to come down afterwards and uh, they get to enjoy and kind of learn a little bit more about it as well. So that's always um, a lot of fun to kind of be able to share that experience with others. If you're interested in learning more about our uh, blog and the Vintage Vittles and keep up with this experience, there's our website right there. And to sum it all up, I just wanted to share a couple of the recipes we've decided not to make because those are even more fun sometimes to learn about what you don't want to create. Uh, barbecue groundhog, roast possum, tomato wine, which is really just alcoholic ketchup. Um, the Asheville salad, which I will read to you. This is the official Asheville salad that was published in 1943. It's one can of tomato soup, three packages of cream cheese, one cup of mayonnaise, quarter cup of celery, a quarter cup of green peppers, a tablespoon of grated onion, a quarter cup of stuffed olives, all enveloped in gelatin and cold water. That does not sound appetizing to me in any way. All gelatin salads, in my opinion, should be done away with, but that's just my personal opinion. And then the husband's delight, which was a delicious thing my coworker found, which is basically just any kind of ground meat you can possibly think, all kinds, just stuff it all together, put it in a bunk cake pan, cook that up and serve it to your husband, and watch him have a heart attack three days later. So in short, that's it. I hope this has inspired some of y'all to maybe think about doing this uh, with your staff. It's a lot of fun and uh, it is delicious. Typically, you might get a, a surprise or two, but um all in all, it's a really good experience. Thank you. That was amazing, Jenny. I don't think I had heard that about Husband's Delight before. Um, it has been nice to see all the dogs and cats and um, Charlie Day and <laughs> some of the good looking food. Um, but let me get started with my presentation. My name is Carly Herndon. 
Uh, I'm the curator of the DeGrumman Children's Literature Collection at the University of Southern Mississippi. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about Letters to the Editor, um, Digital Humanities Meets Highlights for Children magazine. Um, just a little context about the DeGrumman. Um, we have about 1,400 uh, manuscript collections um, from authors and illustrators, editors, and scholars of children's literature. Um, we also have about 250,000 cataloged items like games and books and periodicals, um, even some toys. Um, so for this, today's topic, today's project, um, just a little background about Highlights for Children. You probably recognize Highlights for Children. Um, you probably see it in the dentist's office every time you go, <laughs> definitely in pediatric clinics, um, all over the place. Um, but it began in 1946 in Honesdale, Pennsylvania. Um, and one of the important things about this periodical was that there was no advertising, no commercial messages. Um, it was geared toward elementary students. Um, and between the 1980s and um, the latest number I could find was mid 2010, um, it had over 2 million subscribers. Um, so it's got this huge reach um, to children all over the place. Um, and a lot of the contributing authors and illustrators are represented here in the DeGrumman. So we have some of the original artwork, some of the original manuscripts that folks submitted and were published in the magazine. So there's this nice overlap between um, what's in highlights and what's in our collection. Um, but uh, we received uh, roughly 120 cubic feet of material from highlights um, I believe in 2016, um, and the materials cover about 25 years of the magazine's life, and the majority of what's in that donation uh, was thousands and thousands and thousands of letters from child readers who wrote to the editors of the magazine, um, and included with each letter is an editor's response and draft of that editor's response. So the editors really took these letters seriously um, and several people would look over their responses before they sent them out. Um, also included in that donation were items that were intended for other departments. So the letters to the editor would receive things like contest entries or um, things for other departments to look at. So some of those originals are there and they made copies and sent them on to um, other departments. But here's an example of Highlights Magazine. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are seeing something familiar right now. Um, but so uh, here's one example of a letter. Um, and it says, Dear Highlights, I keep getting in fights with my friend. She keeps saying we shouldn't be friends anymore. What should I do? Please don't write my name down. <laughs> Signed, Janine. Yes, I'm 10. Um, and another example of a letter, and these are both from 1995. Dear Highlight, I don't have a best friend yet, and I'm in fifth grade. My sister says, oh, well. My mom says, you'll meet one next year at middle school. I've never had a sleepover before in my life. How can I get a best friend? Do I have to just be myself <laughs> or just do everything everybody else does? Please help me. And this uh, writer included a nice little drawing of herself. And I wanted to show you an example of an editor's response. Um, and I've just pulled some of their response because these responses would get up to like two page letters. Um, they took them very seriously and gave them incredibly thorough answers. Um, one thing I love seeing in, in these letters is that they always use a colon. They're always very formal. It's, Dear Jennifer, colon. <laughs> um, thank you for your letter. You wrote because you would like to know how you could get a best friend. and uh, They've even mentioned the drawing. Your drawing helped me to understand that you are upset you don't have a best friend. Try to relax and be yourself, be friendly, have a good sense of humor, and let people get to know you. Treat others as you would like them to treat you. So this is just a little snippet of what this editor told this reader um, about you know, what they could do in their situation. Um, so these are two examples of the letters um, in this collection, but um, when I was, sort of looking through the letters one day, we were, re, we were shifting them, we were rehousing them. Um, they came to us in these two foot long boxes. Um, so we were trying to make them a little more manageable. Um, but you, you pull a letter out of any folder and there's a child 
you know, writing about being lonely or there's a child writing about um, not knowing how to make friends or um, they want to learn how to make money or they're asking the editors, how do I learn more about um, sea lions? <laughs> so they really treated highlights um, letters to the editors like we would treat Google now. Um, they asked everything and these editors ended up um, functioning almost like librarians, researchers, um, even social workers at some times. Um, children write in about really difficult questions like my parents are going through a divorce or I'm 10 and I'm wetting the bed, what do I do? Um, so there are really serious questions in there along with some of the cute pictures and things. Um, but uh, I had the idea to map where these letters were coming from because with such a huge audience, I was really curious um, where the letters, you know, where we might see clumps of letters or, or what kind of range of um, reach the magazine might have had. Um, and so in the fall of 2023, I took a graduate digital humanities course here on campus. Um, I was very lucky that they offer that here. And as I started reading and collecting data and learning more about digital humanities, um, that inspired further questions in looking at these letters um, beyond just points on a map. Um, so for the mapping, I did end up using an open source software called QGIS. And I will admit that I still don't fully understand <laughs> this software, um, but I was able to input my data points in the map um, it's not super interesting. I only used 50 samples. I didn't provide a, an image here, um, but I do want to continue to add to that map. Um, to use QGIS, you have to create an Excel spreadsheet, which I also have to fight with. <laughs> um, but things I collected um, were first name, and just like Tara mentioned that they're only collecting children's first names when they interview these middle schoolers, I want to protect these children's identities even though everybody in these letters is an adult now, um, I want to protect their child identity. Um, so we're only collecting first names. If they've provided an age or a grade, I'm including that. Um, I'm guessing at their gender, um, just so we can have a ballpark of, you know, was it 20% boys, 80% girls, or something like that. Um, I'm entering the location. So that includes the city, state, and or country. Um, and for QGIS, you have to include the um, latitude and longitude. <laughs> so I'm, I learned how to do that. Um, I've also in, uh, been collecting the children's concerns. Like what, was, what did they write to the editor about? What were they questioning? Um, and one of the most time consuming things I've been doing is transcribing both the letter from the child and the editor's response. Um, so this is just an example of my spreadsheet and what it would look like. And you'll notice um, towards the bottom of the spreadsheet, you'll see a few adults. So even adults were writing in. And even for the adults, I'm only including their first name because often they're writing on behalf of the child. And I don't want someone to be able to come back through this and say, oh, this was fifth grade teacher at this school named this, and he's named this child in this year in this grade. I don't want that to be possible. Um, so beyond location and uh, something else I started to get curious about was how the children actually wrote the letters, um, particularly thinking about children um, who don't get to learn cursive these days. Um, so I was thinking about, um, you know, will I see trends in cursive usage? Will I see trends in, in print? Will I see any typed <laughs> item? Um, and did they include some sort of drawing? Um, but I've also listed all the concerns I came up with, the big categories of concerns. Um, and for my spreadsheet, this, I put a concern for each, um, each one got a column. And that became a little unwieldy after a while. Um, so one, one takeaway, I haven't gotten that slide yet, but one takeaway is drop down. Drop down saw your friend <laughs> in making spreadsheets. Um, so some of the, the results, I only um, collected data from 50 letters um, for that course project um, using this collection. And 
the, the letters I looked at were answered over two days. So about 25 letters per day were going out from the editor of the magazine, which is a lot. Um, but even in that tiny sample, um, four countries were represented, 19 states, children ages four, uh, seven to 14, and as you saw, some adults. Um, so some takeaways, here are my takeaways. <laughs> um, if you have digital humanities folks on campus, be their friend. <laughs> Go find them, meet them, learn where their office is. They are champions of digital humanities tools. A lot of digital humanities um, software is open source. Um, and a lot of digital humanities experts will know how to use a lot of different tools. Um, they'll also know different things you could do with a data set. Um, so, you know, I started out thinking, I'll just make a map. Um, which was harder than I thought it would be <laughs> on its own. But as we started talking about other things people do in DH, um, I started thinking about um, trends in vocabulary, um, trends in um, uh, slang words over the years, because these letters cover about 25 years. So I'm sure things change. Um, and also, you know, I talked about I was interested in print versus cursive, um, concerns by um, age, year, gender. Um, I'd like to see what these concerns are. Um, so again, use drop downs. <laughs> but I also recommend if you're going to do a big DH project, it's going to be a lot of time up front. But I think in capturing as much data as you can from the beginning, so making that giant spreadsheet with everything you can think of to collect in one go, um, you can have this giant data set that different projects can draw from. Um, so yeah, that is a, an overview of my project. Um, if you have other questions about it, this is our thegrumman.org website where you can check out our collection or also you can feel free to email me. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. We're going to open it up for questions now. So you can unmute yourself or you can put your questions in the chat. Um, yeah, questions or comments. I will say, um, as an avid follower of the Rose Library on Instagram, I do appreciate the recent posts about Bridgerton or Bridgerton themed. Thank so you. good job on that, Gabby. I appreciate oh, it. That took a lot of work. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, and just out of curiosity, Gabby, do you, is there a particular site that you find you have the most traffic on? Yeah, I instagram um the one exception is if y'all don't know about this um every first friday of the month um the u.s national archives does an archives hashtag party um where they announce a theme a couple of days ahead of time and so this month was archives pets they've done like archives games archives under the sea um and if those tend to do really well on twitter more than they do on instagram although the the, the um the game is on both Thank you. <laughs> I will say um, about Carly that it's so cool to see that uh, like that uh, massive amount of letters from children. It's so rare to see juvenilia. Um, it reminds me of like, I think the only thing I can think of that's similar is what you see um, in newspapers around Christmas when all of the letters to Santa come out and you get to, some of the kids are so funny and what they're asking for. Um, they just tell all of the dirt on their siblings. So um, that's really great. Thank you for the work you're doing with that. Thank you. Yeah, and it, I, you know, I, I would agree. Like by having actual materials from children is so rare. Um, so I, you know, when I realized we had this collection, I was like, "Ooh, <laughs> gotta do something with this." <laughs> Does highlight still um, publish? I, I don't have children in my. Okay, cool. Do you think that you'll get more? Um, I'm not sure if we'll we'll get more. Uh, I hope so. Um, I imagine they're getting a lot of emails instead these days. So I 
my guess is that there's not a lot of print materials for them to send us anymore. Um, but I hope so. We'll see. <laughs> Um, Carly, I was going to say that this is an amazing, um, obviously it's an amazing collection. Uh, and as far as DH, I'm known as a DH rocks because my husband's the um, director of the DH, uh, the digital history PhD program, brand new at Clemson. And I think I'll be sending you a few graduate students <laughs> for doing, because I mean, the textual analysis alone should be amazing. And, you know, all of that kind of sentiment analysis and all sorts of things, you know, it, along with network analysis, you've got it all in GIS, you've got everything there. So you go. <laughs> I'm so proud of myself for sort of knowing what you're saying. <laughs> oh, good for you. Yeah. yeah, no, I'll tell you what. Um, yeah, I am. Um, I'm trying to do something similar, but with 17th century women, early, uh, early modern English women's funeral sermons, oh, wow. which is not quite as, you know, it's a little bit, uh, so I'd rather be doing what you're doing. Oh, in a sense. For, <laughs> I, think well, no, I shouldn't say I would rather be, but boy, I would love to, you know, try to be able to figure out the Shakespearean language a little bit more easily. Cool. I was just going to say that I'm I, th I think, I think Carly, I think you have an amazing project, but I was just thinking that every time I saw a Highlights magazine in the doctor's office, it was like a good three years old. So, you know, I was, I was kind of, kind of like, I was reading because I had like nothing else to do, right? Because we didn't have <laughs> smartphones or tablets or anything else to entertain ourselves. Like it was Highlights or nothing. Um, but it would <laughs> never have occurred to me to write a letter to the editor of Highlights Magazine. So I think I'm just fascinated that that all of these children did and that the, the editors were perceived as a knowledge source uh, and, as, as, and as a sort of trusted adult that they could communicate with. Um, and, and I'm also intrigued that there were, you know, teachers who were facilitating this communication. Uh, yeah. Those poor editors must have deserved hazard pay sometimes. I'm sure they got some doozies of letters uh but yeah that's a whole like i'm like this is a whole aspect of childhood that i just totally missed when i was a child <laughs> I, I haven't gone back and looked at the magazines themselves but i'm i'm fairly certain they would publish some of the letters to the editors which is why one of the one of the children was like don't write my name down <laughs> and the editor said okay we if we publish this we won't put your name we'll make you anonymous um so i think that probably inspired other questions um but yeah they really trusted those editors with some some tough subjects um mm -hmm. some lighthearted stuff mm -hmm. too there are pictures of cats there you know here's us at christmas which you know in the oh. 90s you actually had to take a film picture and go get it <laughs> developed and printed and then you send it so they really put some thought into these right. letters you would, yeah. you would have had to persuade a parent to to get the thing developed and Help, you know, you had to go through like the whole process of finding an envelope and writing in the address and getting a stamp and, you know, this whole involved process. Yeah. Well, I have to say, though, that, I mean, I'm old enough, right, that I remember, let's see, reading it probably in the late 60s. It's changed a lot. And there were some pretty, you know, that's why I was saying Goofus and Gallant was the, you know, the good boy and the bad boy. And you're like, oh, boy. But they're fun. It's still, it's gotten, I, you know, you can do so much about the change in, you know, sort of how children are perceived and, and the kinds of articles and games and whatnot over time. That's amazing. Uh, Sandra just put a link to the documentary of Highlights Magazine in the chat. So I have to go check that out as well. Any other um, questions or comments? I want to mention just how cool it's been to see all the different food um, related presentations throughout the day. Um, but that's so awesome that Jenny at your group does that for yourselves, that you have it as staff development. And then you also, you know, you can invite people into and that it has a lasting um, farther reach impact than just the five of y'all. Um, but those are some amazing recipes. And the vinegar taffy sounds 
really horrible. But one of my things I've wanted to do is we have not as many cool ones as you guys uh, cookbooks at, at Rose, but I would like to try to make some on social media um, for people to see the actual process of but haven't yet. Lots of jello. Uh, I would just say that any chance you get to work with food history is it's a direct link to heritage, to past, to tradition. Um, you know, the ability to smell or taste something is one of the fastest ways to trigger nostalgia in your brain. So there is so much richness in the tapestry that is food history. Um, I think it's a great idea to try and share stuff on social media. We have a lot of fun doing it too. And uh, you're, you guys are killing it, by the way. We love, we, we've we got a Swifty here. Uh, Chris is a Swifty and she she was definitely using your stuff for some inspiration for us as well. So thank you for all that you are doing. Yes, and Jenny, I have to say, I may have to steal your idea here at MDAH because we, we have a tradition every summer. We have a staff-wide um, potluck that's tomato sandwich day. They've been doing it for like 50 years or something like that. It started with the patron back in the day who used to bring fresh tomatoes in the summertime. And now it's a thing. And this year in particular, we are doing a uh, contest in honor of a previous director who just passed away last year. Every year for Tomato Sandwich Day, he would bring this specific chocolate pie that was taken from a Great Depression era recipe. And so we're having a contest this year to see who can make the best chocolate pie based on that recipe. So if it goes well, I might have to, I might have to suggest that we also incorporate a historical potluck and make it a whole thing. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? These were all great presentations, um, and so we really appreciate you guys taking the time to um, to to give them to us, and and uh, we thank you to all the guests who attended. At this time, I'm going to just turn everything over to Jennifer and Gabby. If you guys have any closing remarks, you guys can take it away. Yeah, I was. I mean, I'm going to echo uh, Miranda and say thank you all of you so much uh, for coming and for sticking out, sticking it out to the end of the day. I know it's been a very. I know we're on Zoom, but it's still a very long day. Uh, and then um, I do have a little uh, survey, a little assessment form, so we we can do our very important assessment piece. And uh, I'm just going to put that link in the chat, and then Gabby, I will send it to you so it can be mailed out to everyone who registered, even if they didn't come, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we can try and um, get some feedback and make it even better next year. Uh, and I am also going to, uh, I'm going to let Gabby talk for a minute while I look up yeah. that I want to share. Uh, but I'm also, I'm also going to, to, uh, to once again, say we are still looking for uh, some state uh, state rep volunteers from Tennessee and South Carolina, and we do still need some officers for SCAA. Uh, so, if anyone would like to um, to to join us in our shenanigans, um, I'm going to let Gabby talk while I find the uh, the nomination form. So, okay, yes. So, thank you, everyone, um, on behalf of Society of Georgia Archivists for coming out yesterday and today and joining us, please join us. It's a very small um, uh, fee to join, especially if you're in Georgia or, or nearby enough that you could come and see some of the things we do. We have an annual meeting in October, which for those of you who are in SGA should be announced soon, hopefully, fingers crossed, um, the actual registration for. We also do um, events throughout the year um, like this. We also have, um, we just did a tour of NARA Atlanta last month. Um, and the hope is to have more events like that that are free and people can come visit. Um, and then also, as you all heard several times throughout the day, this um, this these presentations have been recorded and they will be posted on the Society of Georgia Archivists YouTube, um, hopefully soon. Um, but that will be sent out as well when that's ready. Okay, so I have managed to to post the link. 
uh, to to the nominations. Uh, you can self nominate for the uh, for the state rep positions. You do not have to be elected. If you volunteer, you're in. Um, and uh, and for the for the no, the thing position we most need to fill right now is vice president, and we're trying to make it so that not one state does not dominate. Uh, and that's why it's people who are from who are not from North Carolina or Mississippi that we're looking for. So if you don't want to do it, if you know someone who does, uh, please alert them to our existence. Um, we are a great service opportunity, I promise. Uh, anyway, with that, I will say have a great weekend. We'll see y'all later. Um, bye. <laughs> bye, everyone. Thank you.